Hello and welcome to I Know Dino, a podcast about dinosaurs and all things dinosaur related. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. Today we'll be interviewing Dr. Anthony J. Martin, who is an ichnologist, which means he studies all of the non-bone related traces from dinosaurs, which is coprolite, also known as dinosaur fossilized poop, and dinosaur tracks, gastrolis, which are stones that they swallowed, and anything else that gets fossilized or preserved that isn't the dinosaur itself. It gives a deeper understanding of the day-to-day lives of dinosaurs than you can get from their bones or even their skin or feathers or anything. It's really, in some ways, a lot more interesting than studying bones because you can see whether the dinosaurs raised their young or whether they left them at a young age. You can tell whether they hunted in packs or if they migrated as a herd. You can tell how quickly they moved by how far apart their their footprints are spaced. And you can tell how big they were when they were born because it includes things like their nests. Joining us is Dr. Anthony Martin, a paleontologist and professor at Emory College in Atlanta, Georgia. He specializes in ichnology, which studies things such as animal burrows, tracks, trails, and feces, and can ascertain dinosaur habits, diet, and migration patterns, among other things. He's known for discovering the first known burrowing dinosaur, as well as discovering the best assemblage of polar dinosaur tracks in the southern hemisphere. And he's also the author of several books, and the most recent one is called Dinosaurs Without Bones, Dinosaur Lives Revealed by Their Trace Fossils. So, uh, welcome, and thank you again for this interview. Well, thank you for asking me, Sabrina. This is a pleasure. (laughs) So, how did you get into this field, like, specifically ichnology? Like, what made you interested? Technology interested me when I was in graduate school. I first started hearing about these trace fossils. These are traces made by animals and plants that get preserved in the fossil record. What really drew me in about trace fossils was realizing that these were the products of behavior. These trace fossils tell you fracks, burrows, nests, feces. These tell you what a particular animal was doing on a particular day millions of years ago. For me, that imaginative draw of trace fossils, uh, I just haven't gotten over it. It's something that excites me every time I look at one. I read that you study both modern and ancient traces. Do you have a preference? (laughs) Um, Yeah, it depends on which day it is and where I am. (laughs) Like right now, I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Uh, So necessarily I have to look at modern traces if I'm going out for a stroll. So that's going to be fantastic as I walk through a city park. I can see there are the burrows made by bees, or there's an ant nest, or there's the drill holes on a tree left by a woodpecker. There are those raccoon tracks going through the park in the middle of the night that people didn't know raccoons lived there. Those sorts of traces will draw me in uh, for the modern perspective. But if I'm out west, let's say uh, just three weeks ago, I was out in Montana looking at Cretaceous age tracks and other traces, those then are what are going to be my focus. Although I don't ignore the modern traces I see around there too. So yeah, it just depends on where I am and what I'm doing those days. So I read in your recent book, you said that ichnology is about storytelling and coming up with a lot of what-if scenarios. So how can you be sure of these scenarios, and like, what's a typical process for coming up with them? Some of the scenarios that I bring into that story at the, the beginning of Dinosaurs Without Bones, some of them are we're pretty sure about. We are very sure, for instance, that there were dinosaurs that sat down or that swam or made nests a certain way, or made burrows. Those sort of ideas have been backed up again and again uh, from the evidence we get from dinosaur trace fossils. Sometimes we just have the trace fossils. Sometimes we have their bones associated with the trace fossils, or we have other fossils that might be interacting, like dinosaur feces, for instance. Mm -hmm. I wrote how there were dung beetles great thundering herds of dung beetles, as I like to say, (laughs) that were attracted to this dinosaur dung. Well, we know about that because the research uh, that Dr. Karen Chin did 
on dinosaur feces showing that there were traces left by dung beetles that matched what we see with modern dung beetles. We're very sure about that. So some of the scenarios that I presented uh, were a little more imaginative, but in those cases, I admitted it mm -hmm. <laughs> and said also that in science we predict that sometimes we get trace fossils that show a certain kind of behavior. Well, it might be something else, but we also can predict that we should find these, these, and these trace fossils. And I have a little wish list at the end of the book that kind of says, uh, here are some future scenarios we might be fulfilling with scientific evidence. What's at the top of your list? Oh, at the top of my wish list, I think was a trackway made by a large predatory dinosaur, something like a Tyrannosaurus or Spinosaurus, one of those other really large predators. Mm -hmm. What's very cool is that was toward the top of my wish list. I don't remember exactly which number it was. But that got fulfilled last month. There were uh, five or six technologists who published a paper just last month about these two dinosaur trackways in British Columbia that showed these two large predatory, probably tyrannosaur-sized theropod dinosaurs were walking parallel to one another. So that suggested gregarious behavior, that these large dinosaurs may have been hunting together or at least moving together. That was pretty cool. <laughs> so just going back to the kind of storytelling aspect, what are your thoughts on fiction about dinosaurs? Like... I, I think I read you mentioned paleontologists in general try to steer clear of writing fiction, but then your opening scene in in the book was just, I really enjoyed reading it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I would love to see more paleontologists write fiction purposefully and tell everybody, please, this is fiction, <laughs> but use their knowledge, use their experience to be able to spin some more imaginative stories. Now, sometimes it does seem like we're spinning imaginative stories already, but we scientists, we try to use our evidence-based reasoning as part of that, or if we're being speculative, we say, well, here's a speculation, and it's a prediction, and then we try to disprove it, like any good scientist would do. But I would love to see more people doing fiction with dinosaurs that is not necessarily backed up by evidence, but inspired by evidence. What's also neat to realize, if you're doing that kind of fiction, is you start looking at what has been shown by the fossil record, especially for dinosaurs, and sometimes they were way more crazy than we could make up. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes fact is going to trump fiction, especially as we get new revelations about dinosaurs and how they behaved toward one another, toward other animals, toward plants, or their ecosystems in general. Do any examples spring to mind? Well, we're finding out now, an example of how uh, we're finding out now that the line we draw between what's a dinosaur, what's a bird, we now know that modern birds are dinosaurs. So I have a chapter in the book that's about birds as modern dinosaurs and those dinosaurian trace makers that you can track a dinosaur today by just going to your local park and watching birds and seeing what traces they make. That line is getting so blurred now that we're realizing some of these small feathered dinosaurs probably were arboreal, that they were going up in trees and that they were either gliding or flying from tree to tree. That sort of blurred line where what's a bird, what's a dinosaur, it's now become confusing. Even for those of us who study that, it's getting really confusing if somebody just asks us, well, where do you draw the line? We're not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> and some of what we're seeing now with what are we're, we know are non-avian dinosaurs, they were behaving in a very bird-like manner. And I think in the future, one of the other chapters I have in the chapter looks at nesting and nesting behavior in dinosaurs. I think we're going to find more and more examples of that where these non-avian dinosaurs were nesting very much like birds, that this sort of behavior goes back um, maybe farther and in more lineages of dinosaurs than we ever would have suspected. Interesting.
Yeah, the your book also mentioned Dinosaur Swam. I didn't realize. <laughs> and they may have done recreational activities? Uh, recreational activities? Yeah. Is there any evidence of that? Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not right. I did ask, uh, ask that question. Is there any... We see this with a lot of animals today, modern animals, that uh, they sometimes did play, that we see play behavior in a lot of uh, mammals that's used as a way of teaching. We also now see there's learning behavior and teaching behavior in some species of birds. So I get into that. Well, by recreational activities, do you also mean dinosaur sex? Yeah, I yeah. speculate a little bit about that, too. <laughs> and, of course, that wasn't necessarily recreational. That was, may have been procreational, but who knows? Um, yeah, I do speculate a little bit about that because we haven't found any definite dinosaur trace fossils demonstrating sex. We know they had sex. We know that. And they did for 160 million years. Um, and then with modern birds, of course, they continue that proud behavior. Uh, but we don't really have direct trace fossil evidence of that either. So I would be interested in seeing, is there any evidence, and I guess I can put into play, say, courtship behavior. Is there any evidence of play, courtship behavior, uh, actual coitus, post-coitus? I even make a little joke in there about that. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps the uh, gender differences we might see with those. Those sorts of traces, we haven't really nailed those down yet. So that's something that I took a little more of a speculative view on those, but gave a little summary and guideposts for future paleontologists, and I think I said dirty-minded paleontologists, which basically all of us, <laughs> is uh, how we could find these trace fossils in the future. So what, if anything, tells us more about dinosaurs? You think tracks or the, the feces, tooth marks, nest burrows, maybe something else? What are some examples of what we can learn from them? Oh gosh, how can I choose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm more of a holistic ethnologist in that, well, for example, where I was just doing field work out in Montana, uh, it was in the Two Medicine Formation. Uh, the rocks there were about 75 million years old. At a minimum, the dinosaur trace fossils I could see there just in a day of walking around included coprolites, dinosaur coprolites, tooth marks, uh, dinosaur nests, tracks, that was a minimum. I could see that just in, in a morning. I could walk around that area and see evidence through those trace fossils. So it really depends on where you are, what rocks you're in, what sort of evidence got preserved. Like if I'm in a place that's world famous for its dinosaur tracks, then of course I'll focus on those. That tells us all sorts of fantastic behavior about how they were moving. Uh, the chapter I have on dinosaur tracks, it's the longest in the book. It's titled, uh, These Feet Were Made for Walking, Running, Sitting, Swimming, Hurting, and Hunting. <laughs> and that's really an abbreviated title, because tracks can tell us even more than, than those. But nests are also extremely valuable, especially for telling us about post-mating behavior, bringing up dinosaur babies, uh, what happened after, after the eggs hatched. Nurturing behavior in dinosaurs. Nests have that potential to tell us about dinosaurs. Dinosaur burrows tell us about that as an adaptation against, say, predators or just getting out of the way of natural disasters like forest fires. Of course, tooth marks tell us about what dinosaurs ate, who ate who, and how did they eat them, and what sort of damage was sometimes left on teeth by plants what that dinosaurs were eating. And then, of course, yeah, I love coprolites. Coprolites <laughs> tell you exactly what a dinosaur was eating on a given day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so all of those, yeah, I, don't make me choose. I just love them all. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Are trace fossils in general kind of hard to find and identify? Uh, it depends. Tracks, I think, are very easy for most people to to find. And I think even an untrained amateur, if you go out in a place that has some well-preserved dinosaur tracks, and I have to qualify that by saying well-preserved dinosaur tracks, they often will spot them. So uh, I'll, I'll bet that more than half of the dinosaur tracks that have been discovered from the fossil record have been by untrained amateurs people who were out 
hiking in the remote area. They saw some three-toed or four-toed tracks, and there was something in our primate brains that we go track, that we instantly recognize that pattern as being something from an animal. And sometimes um, it's kind of paradoxical. Sometimes you overlook them if they're too big, though. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> you walk by them and you think that's a pothole. Like, whoa, how many potholes were there in the Mesozoic? Come on, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see the potholes resolve themselves in a pattern. And you see, oh, that's a diagonal walking pattern. Ooh, cool. So I think tracks for most people are easy to spot. Other ones, other trace fossils, not so easy. Coprolites take a lot of training, I think, because a lot of people get a... Um, false identification. They'll pick up something lumpy that it looks like dung, it smells like dung, good thing I didn't step in it sort of thing. They bring it, they're very excited, they bring it to their local museum, they bring it to the paleontologist at that museum, they show it to her and she goes, I'm sorry, that's not a copper light. <laughs> and then it kind of reminds you of the X-Files, I want to believe. <laughs> no, well, it's not about belief, it's about what's there. It has to have digested material in it for one. It can't just look like a coprolite. It has to have evidence that it went through the gut of an animal. And then, did it belong to a dinosaur? That narrows it down, too. Yeah. You have to ask yourself, and then which dinosaur might it belong to? Um, and I think the toughest trace fossil of all to identify from a dinosaur, what I haven't mentioned yet, is a gastrolet. These are stomach stones that dinosaurs swallow them. Not all dinosaurs, just a, just a few are finding now swallow these stones to help with their digestion. These rocks are so difficult to distinguish from just an ordinary rock that did not reside in the dinosaur gut. So I have a whole chapter on it. It's titled, Why Would a Dinosaur Eat a Rock? That explores that, about how difficult it is to distinguish what's a gastrolith and what's not a gastrolith from rocks that are in the same sediments that contain, say, dinosaur bones, tracks, or other type of dinosaur fossils. That's a tough one. Uh, those, those would be the most challenging for just, say, Joe or Joanne Q public to be able to identify. Sure. That, how would you as a paleontologist identify it? Oh, boy. I, I would have a tough time. There's only a few people who... I think are really good at it. You look for a polished surface, that's one clue. You pick it up and it looks like it's been polished. You're in rocks of the right age, so you're in rocks that do contain the remains of dinosaurs. It's from the right environment, like flood river floodplains or coastal shorelines. You might see some little chatter marks on it from where it impacted with another rock, but the chatter marks have to be in a way that they weren't made in a surf like from a surf uh, knocking the rocks back and forth. They also oftentimes are quartz, so they did not dissolve. Think about a dinosaur swallowing a limestone. That would have been the Mesozoic equivalent of swallowing a Tums. <laughs> <laughs> it may have just dissolved in their stomach, no evidence of a gastrolith there. Uh, so it has to be something that would be resistant to stomach acids too. So it might actually show some evidence of that as well, that there might even be a little bit of acid etching preserved in it. But usually uh, the people who have distinguished this, uh, they've had to use microscopes or lasers or other types of special equipment to be able to determine for sure that this came from a, the gut of the dinosaur. Fortunately, modern birds also swallow stones. We also have big birds that live just recently called moas in New Zealand that they also swallowed stones, so they had gastroliths. So we can actually look at moa gastroliths as recent examples of avian dinosaurs doing this. We can also look at modern birds that swallow stones and look at the characteristics of those. And then we can do the comparison. So we have uh, these modern equivalents with our modern dinosaurs that we can compare to what we see in uh, fossil dinosaurs. You mentioned uh, Lark Quarry in Australia is a good place to um, is a famous dinosaur track site. What are some other places with trace fossils that are kind of famous? Yeah, Lark Quarry was in the news again recently because the most recent study done on it, I mentioned uh, the researchers in that chapter, and I, 
I'm glad I left the chapter and ended it kind of open-ended as a question of shrugging. It's like, who knows, uh, rather than taking a stand, because we're now finding uh, that Lark Horry, looking at the evidence, having read the uh, most recent paper, it does look fairly convincing that this was a dinosaur swim site rather than a dinosaur track site. Oh. They, yes, there are tracks there, but they were probably from uh, dinosaurs that were going across a water body. Uh, they look very similar to the tracks then that we see in southwestern Utah, St. George, Utah, which has thousands, and I've seen them, it's, it's incredible, thousands of dinosaur tracks that had to have been made from them swimming that they have the right pattern, they have the right form to them, and uh, they just have all of these characteristics that show these were dinosaurs that were probably buoyed up by water and their toes were just touching the bottom as they were kind of, I won't say dog paddling, dinosaur paddling along. I was also fascinated, you mentioned sauropods may have made trails that transformed like the land and the waterways of the areas they lived in. Could you elaborate? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I had to say what was my favorite chapter to write in the book, it was the last chapter. It was called Dinosaurian Landscapes and Evolutionary Traces. And that was one of the points I brought up, is that sauropods probably changed their landscapes. And those changes then, in an iterative sort of way, then affected landscapes we have today. And I even speculated... I don't think unreasonably speculated that maybe some of these river valleys we have today that date back to the time of sauropods, maybe those were affected, the course of those river valleys were affected by sauropods. Now, the modern analogs I use, and they're really weak analogs, I will admit, because they're too small, (laughs) would be elephants and hippos. Mm -hmm. That uh, hippos, for instance, make these, trails that go from their water bodies across land and connect water bodies. And because they're big animals and they wear down these trails, they end up connecting the water bodies and making these really deep channel forms that actually can change the courses of the rivers or otherwise change the landscape. Um, Elephants do the same sort of thing, but they completely change landscapes, especially wetlands, that the elephant trails over time will connect all of these wetlands that normally would not be connected. On a smaller scale, flamingos, I cite a study by Jenny Scott and some of her colleagues that they did in Eastern Africa where they were looking at flamingo nesting ground, where these millions of flamingos, they're making these mound nests. Over time, millions of flamingos making nests in that same area around these lake shores completely changed the flow regime of those lake shores. So these are small animals compared to dinosaurs, Mm -hmm. elephants, hippos, flamingos, for sure, very small animals. But then there's that strength in numbers and then time. Of course, we paleontologists always think about time, how that had to have changed the landscapes. So that evidence from Western Australia of uh, dinosaur trails that Tony Tolborn proposed, I, I think he's absolutely right, that these were trails that sauropods over time wore them down actually changed the landscape there at that time, 100 million years ago. That's just crazy to think about. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, that was my favorite chapter to write because it had, okay, you thought stuff was mind-boggling? Wait till you read this. Yeah. (laughs) And just kind of tying it all together, how these traces are more than just a single footprint, a gastrolith, a copper light. No, you look at your landscape, that might have been affected by a dinosaur. Yeah. I also noticed you mentioned Jurassic Park a few times in the book, and it sounded like you didn't care too much for the sequels. What's your feelings on the first movie? (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. I finally got myself to watch all of uh, Jurassic Park 2 recently, Uh, and it actually wasn't as bad as I originally thought, (laughs) uh, because I only saw, I never saw the whole thing. I always caught snippets of it on TV or saw some clips on YouTube. And then I, I heard from my paleontologist friends, they're like, oh, it was so bad compared to the original. I mean, almost everybody loves the original. And I watched it, and it actually wasn't that bad. A cool thing that happened in it that I wish I'd known about before was that the big game hunter character, I've forgotten his name, 
in the movie, he's actually tracking the Tyrannosaur at one time, and they show his Tyrannosaur-sized tracks. So I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to make myself rewatch. I have seen all of Jurassic Park 3. I am going to make myself rewatch it and, again, think about what sort of traces are in the movie. And then I, on my blog, uh, Life Traces of the Georgia Coast, I did a blog entry last year about with the re-release of Jurassic Park in 3D. I went to go see it in a the theater in 3D, but I took note of what traces were shown in the movie or what was based on ethnology. What were some of the dinosaur behaviors in the movie based on ethnology? Uh, and that was really fun to do. It was actually fairly extensive. It was a, it was a long post <laughs> on that topic. And it was I titled it The Ethnology of Jurassic Park. So I totally expect to do that with Jurassic World, or, or so-called Jurassic Park 4, <laughs> that's supposed to come out next summer. Right. And we'll see. So I may enjoy it just with the ethnology <laughs> and hate the movie. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look out for your blog post. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so do you have a favorite dinosaur? Oh, uh, I'm pretty biased about that. It's Erectodromius cubicularis. Uh, I describe it in detail in Chapter 4 of the book, uh, which is titled, no, Chapter 5, I'm sorry, it's uh, Dinosaurs Down Underground. Erectodromius cubicularis, I got the co-name. <laughs> it uh, means, using the Greek roots, it means a digging runner of the den. Uh, and it was an ornithopod dinosaur, a small ornithopod herbivorous dinosaur that dug its own burrow. And it was found in its own burrow with two of its partially grown juveniles. So this was the first evidence of dinosaur denning behavior. I described this, uh, the burrow, with uh, my colleague and friend David Barecchio, and we have colleague Yoshi Gatsura, who discovered the dinosaur in the field uh, in southwestern Montana. Once the bones were extracted from what was originally the den, they realized this dinosaur had adaptations for digging, that its shoulder girdle was perfectly adapted for, for digging. It had an extra vertebrae in its hip to brace itself during digging, and its uh, snout was also kind of shovel-like and probably hated it also in digging. So these three traits of that dinosaur, along with it being in a burrow, along with the two juveniles being in the burrow with it, and both of those juveniles being of the same age, this was all very persuasive evidence that Erectodromius was a burrowy dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And the first one that we know of from the geologic record. I think we'll find more examples. I think we will find more. That's a prediction I make in the book. And uh, there will be some day that I think we'll find other small dinosaurs probably did this too. My last question is, what advice would you have for amateur dinosaur enthusiasts? Like, where, where should they go to learn more about their favorite dinosaurs? One of the best resources they could use is uh, the national and state parks that we have as public resources that are readily available for the public to use. So I always urge the public, use these public resources, because then you as a user, you'll benefit from it, and then future generations will too. An example of that might be, oh, it's, uh, I don't know the exact name. I haven't been to it in Connecticut. That's, uh, I think it's Dinosaur State Park. So that's a dinosaur track site there in Connecticut that uh, people can go to. It's enclosed in a building, and they can see hundreds of dinosaur tracks from the early Jurassic from about 200 million years ago there. Or you can go to Dinosaur Valley State Park, where I did some research a couple of years ago. I'm currently writing an article about some of the trace fossils there. Dinosaur Valley State Park that's in Texas that has some of the best preserved sauropod tracks of anywhere in the world. Right there in a state park, you can go see them. Then for dinosaur bones, if you want to see those, and you know, I'm, I'm okay with bones. <laughs> I, actually, <laughs> I joke about that throughout the book, like bones, bah, who cares? But actually, one of the coolest places you could ever see uh, dinosaur bones is uh, Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. Oh, yeah, I've been uh, there. Do make it. Yeah, yeah. I just urge everybody, if at all possible, go there, make a trip, go see it. What's also cool is just south of there, if you go around Moab, there are some dinosaur track sites down around Moab, Utah. 
and then there's a few other places where you can, in public resources like uh, Bureau of Land Management land or some of these other public lands, these are some of the best places to go and see, say, dinosaur tracks in the field. What's cool about that, you, where you see those tracks, that's where a dinosaur was. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't always know that with bones. But those sorts of resources that are out there, um, I say avail yourself as much as possible. And museums, don't ignore museums. Museums are fantastic resources, too. Some of them are public, some of them are private. Uh, but if you can actually get to a, a park or any place that has these tracks or bones available for you, the public, to see, uh, that's something I would do. It will fill you with awe. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. It was a pleasure talking with you. So as Dr. Martin mentioned, dinosaur tracks play a big role in understanding dinosaurs. You can tell whether they were in a herd, whether they were solo. Sometimes you can tell how quickly they were moving and all sorts of things of that nature. There's a neat place in Connecticut called Dinosaur State Park. And there's a website, dinosaurstatepark.org, where you can learn more about it. It's actually a preserved area of dinosaur tracks where you can see several different dinosaurs and they explain what the dinosaurs were doing in that area at that time. And if you want to see the exact address, you can also go to our website, inodino.com, and we have a map of lots of dinosaur museums and sites. Our dinosaur of the day is Erictodromius, which is the dinosaur that Dr. Martin mentioned having co-discovered. So Erectodromius is Greek for burrowing runner, and uh, as Dr. Martin said in his interview, uh, is, first, is the first known burrowing dinosaur, which he and his colleagues found an adult and two juveniles in a fossilized chamber in 2007. Uh, they had died and decayed in the burrow, which looked similar to burrows made by hyenas and puffins. Having the juveniles with the adults suggests parental care and that at least one motivation for burrowing was to take care of the juveniles, and the size of the juveniles suggests an extended period of parental care. Erictodromius lived during the Middle Cretaceous, which is towards the end of the dinosaur era. They lived in southwestern Montana and southwestern Idaho. They were up to 6.8 feet long and weighed about 70 pounds. So they were one of the small, quick dinosaurs that you imagine. They didn't have long arms and legs like modern burrowing animals, like a mole or a wombat, but they did have specialized adaptations, like a snout and a tail that was more flexible than other ornithopods, so it could curl up underground when it was in its little burrow. Those adaptations made it resemble a rabbit, aardvark, or a hyena more than some of the other modern burrowing animals. So our fun fact of the day is that the largest dinosaur eggs were about the size of basketballs. The bigger the egg, the thicker the shell had to be. So if the eggs had been larger, the dinosaur babies may not have been able to get out. Aside from being able to break out of the egg shell as a baby dinosaur, you could also have limits in the permeability of oxygen through the shell because... If you imagine the baby dinosaur living inside, it has to get all of its oxygen through the shell, and it can only diffuse so quickly, and obviously when you're going through a solid shell, there are limits to that. And that's it for this episode of I Know Dino. Join us next time when we talk to Dr. Philip Percuri, a famous paleontologist from Canada who is also the creator of the free online course Dino 101. If you'd like to learn more about dinosaurs or see dinosaur events, dinosaur museums, or other dinosaur sites around America, the United States of America, <laughs> a little bit in Canada, we only have one or two sites up there so far, um, you can go to inodino.com, and we look forward to talking to you next week, talking to you next week, talking to you next week, talking to you next week.